Welcome to the recording of the web seminar BRICS, a traditional player shaping the future, which was part of the Nature Plus series, Building Materials of the Future, how classics and newcomers are making construction more sustainable. Thank you for watching. Yeah, welcome, welcome to today's uh, web seminar. It's, it's the second one in, uh, in the series. Um, and my name is Katrina. I'm going to be your host and moderator today. And of course, with me is also uh, Timan Kramulisch um, from yes. Nature Plus. Hi, Timan. <laughs> Hello, good morning to everyone on this Friday. Good to see you here. We have a very nice spring day here in southern Germany. I hope you also were from wherever you are switched in today. You also have a nice day and yeah, looking forward to this Webseminar series. Yeah, before we start uh, today, we have uh, lots of very, very exciting, interesting speakers uh, with us and we're very much looking forward to this. Um, but we have a few organizational things for you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen once again and um, just lead you through and uh, give you a few information um, but I'll make sure to keep it nice and short. Um, all right uh, so just uh, for those of you um, who haven't been with us last uh, time um, for your information this web seminar is being recorded and after the whole web seminar uh, series has finished, you will receive access to all the recordings and also most of the presentations um, the speakers present to you. Also, you have the option of receiving a certificate of attendance, um, for example, for the German uh, Chamber of Architects, Architektenkammer, um, or um, other purposes. So if that's uh, interesting to you, if you'd like that, please contact us um, via email boss at natureplus.org. Um, I will post the email address in the chat um, later on so you can copy it if you'd like. Um, a few technical notes. Um, I, I suspect that most of you by now are very, very familiar with uh, Zoom after one year of uh, Zoom meetings without an end, I guess. But still, we'd like you to ask you to mute yourselves um, whenever you're not speaking, just to limit um, and minimize background noises. Also, um, please don't uh, switch on your video, um, just so yeah, our 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 quality um, stays uh, kind of st uh, stable. Um, of course, later on in our discussion in the end of this web seminar, if you're talking to us, feel free to show yourself if you want to, um, but not during the presentations, please. Um, also, later on in the discussion, you can raise your hand. Um, I'll show you how to do that um, in a second. And we would like to encourage you to use the chat function um, during also during the presentation. So if you have questions, um, um, post them in, in the chat and tell us um, which uh, speaker you are um, referring to. And we will collect the uh, questions for the end of the web seminar. So we will not do any questions in between, um, but do the presentations first. And, but yeah, use the chat also if you have any remarks or anything to contribute. It's always nice um, if, if you're, there's some action in the chat. Yeah, and just make sure if you're using the chat to um, to put, uh, to set the drop down on all, um, this is how you um, send the message to all the participants and not just to particular people. Um, and again, um, under participants, sorry for the German interface here, um, but I think you can, you can guess where you have to go. There is the little hand here for, when you want to raise your hand in the end of this session for the discussion. Yeah, what's going to happen today? Um, BRICS, a traditional player shaping the future, question mark. This is our topic. Um, we are right in the middle of the welcoming part um, with uh, Tillman and myself. So Tillman is going to uh, say a few words about Nature Plus in a second. And also we are very delighted to have Judith Ottich with us today from Architects for Future. And she will say a few words and then uh, we will head into the presentation, um, into the presentations with uh, Gerhard Koch, um, Doris Wirth, 
Paul Vermeulen, uh, Benjamin Ibora, and Mario Kubista. And then in the end, as I said, we have time for some Q&A and discussion. Um, also, there's going to be a 10 minute break um, after Mrs. Wirt's uh, presentation. So yeah, if you need some more coffee or a drink or something like that. Yeah, so that's uh, what's gonna happen today. Um, if there's any questions, please uh, let me know. Other than that, um, Tillman, I'd like to hand, ah, sorry, we have, <laughs> sorry, no, one thing before. Um, before uh, Tillman's gonna say a few words, um, we would like to know something from you actually, um, because we are always curious about our audience and who's in there and what opinions you have. So Tillman, would you please show us um, the poll we prepared? Yes. There we go. All right, so if you care to, um, to participate, um, we would like to know right now in this moment, before you have heard any of the presentations, uh, what's your opinion on bricks? Are you a fan um, and think we should build more with bricks? Do you think it's promising material for the future, but uh, there need to be some improvements in, in manufacturing, for example? Um, are you of the opinion that uh, bricks are not particularly sustainable, but at least they're cheap? Um, or are you not a fan at all and think we should build actually less with bricks? And if none of that applies, um, of course, you can click other or um, feel free to tell us in the chat because I'm sure we, we didn't cover every opinion imaginable on bricks. Okay, I think everyone who wanted to participate uh, did. So Tillman, would you show us the results? Okay. So the uh, majority um, thinks it's a promising material for the future. Um, so we see if the um, presentation support this opinion today. Um, and then, yeah, there is a few that are big fans already. And um, also some that are a bit more critical, um, five people, um, like three of them don't think they're particularly sustainable and two people clicked on not a fan at all. So yeah, it's a nice mix and we will see how that develops in the course of the web seminar. So we have another poll for you in the end, <laughs> if the opinion might have been changed. All right, um, thank you very much for participating. But now, Actually, I'm going to hand over to Tillman. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Katerina. Um, I also just see in the chat that um, there are also some comments on the poll we just uh, had. So um, yeah, feel free to um, to put anything um, in the, into the chat. And um, yes, again, a warm welcome from my side to everyone. And really, it's a pleasure for Nature Plus to host this webinar, web seminar today with such fantastic speakers um, already introduced by Katharina and about actually a very interesting building material bricks. End of March this year, the Federal Association of the German Brick and Tile Industry announced ambitious targets for climate neutrality by 2050. Quite interesting. At the same time, however, there are voices that uh, doubt that bricks can contribute really to better climate. And against this background, I'm really looking forward to the to an intense discussion today and in lightful presentations. And um, maybe let me introduce very shortly Nature Plus for all that couldn't take part at the kickoff event uh, we had last time. Um, about wood. So um, Nature Plus is the um, International Association for Sustainable Building and Living. We are a non-profit environmental association and a member-based network. And we are working and engaging for a sustainable building sector. And doing this, we are convinced that for climate protecting, resource saving, and also healthy building and living, the materials you use, we all use are key. 
And um, if you go to the next slide, um, there you just uh, get a short overview about um, our partners. Um, we have members from all over Europe in all relevant areas of the construction sector. So it's quite an interesting mix, uh, mix we have in this um, association. And yeah, we are very happy to work with um, such great organizations together, such as Arcodome in the UK, or, uh, sorry, in the Netherlands or ASPP in in the UK, Ebo in Austria, and many, many more to name. And um, yeah, if you go to the next slide, uh, just very shortly, you see that we offer uh, a lot of information on building materials and services, and many of you may know the Nature Plus Eco label for sustainable building products. We also do um, campaigning together with other associations, of course, um, seminars like uh, this we, we are hosting today. And um, next slide, please, Katharina. Um, so um, you are very invited to get involved with Nature Plus. You, um, we are always uh, happy for if we have new members. Also, if you um, you can work within our um, working groups about specific topics about building materials and criteria for these building materials. And also, if you have a um, a concrete project idea or whatever, just feel free to contact us and. Um, now, I really would like to express my sincere thanks to our sponsors. Um, their support actually makes it possible for us to put on such a comprehensive um, series of web webinars we, we are holding here. So uh, first of all, many thanks to our um, premium sponsors, Lignotrend and Wienerberger Austria, and also to our theme uh, theme sponsors, um, the BVSA and Cuba and Jivut. And if you're curious what um, our um, what they are doing, what is standing behind these um, these letters, uh, just go into our um, forum sponsors forum. We will share the link again in the chat. And as you know, we host this series together with Architects for Future, and I'm really happy that Judith is here today with us and that you will give some welcoming words um, by yourself. So um, Judith, the stage is yours. And yeah, I think uh, Katarina will uh, share the screen and the presentation for Judith. So yeah, your presentation should be visible. I hope that's working. Oops. Yes, perfect. Can you, can, can you hear me and can you see me? Yes. Perfect. I'm just going to pretend I have a little presenter that clicks forward like this because there are many slides, right? Like this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm, try. I'm gonna try to not miss anything, but yeah. Okay. Cool. <laughs> cool. All right. Okay. Hello everyone from Heidelberg. My name is Judith Ottich. I'm an architect and co-founder of Architects for Future. And we're very glad to be part of this web seminar series. And I'm excited to hear about the modular wonders of brick architecture today. Um, Architects for Future, for those who don't know us yet, was founded to support the claims of the climate movement, especially Fridays for Future, and translate them to the building sector. We are campaigning for a transition towards sustainable construction, and we're coming from every corner of construction, so you don't have to be an architect to work with us. Right now we're count counting about 800 volunteers, with different backgrounds, so lots of collective knowledge and experience. We live in a globalized and interconnected world and our cities are interdependent. They rely on a healthy environment and more or less stable climate conditions. But right now cities are overheating and are threatened by floods how we design our cities impacts our society and our health, and we'll do so even more in the future. When we're talking about fighting climate change, we need to address the elephant in the room, and that's the building sector. So we need some numbers. <laughs> when we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions, over the life cycle of a building, we're finding that construction, energy consumption and transport amount to 40%. So that's a big share. And 
With that big share come big responsibilities. But the building sector right now isn't transitioning yet. In fact, it's the only one in Germany that didn't reach the necessary reductions in 2020. And that was the year with the global pandemic. Need I remind anyone? Unfortunately, our problems don't end with emissions. Most of our finite mineral raw materials go into construction. Building is responsible for more than half of Germany's waste. And we're still sealing the soil at a rate way too fast when we should be desealing already. All that isn't news, actually. There's a history of developing ideas and solutions. Now we know that we can do things differently and even how we can do things differently. But we're still building as if there was no tomorrow. Because we consume more, efficiency gains are counteracted, a solid rebound effect. So at this point in time, we should ask ourselves, do we need to build at all? We say the existing buildings all around us have great potential. We just need to get a little creative and look at what's already there, right in front of our eyes. Of course, we need to decrease operational energy by making existing buildings more energy efficient. If we avert demolition, we won't just save embodied energy, but also our historic heritage. That's why those retrofits have to take into account local history and residents. And if we do it right, we'll use circular materials for restoration and refurbishments. When we use local renewable resources and reuse material, we can solve the raw material crisis. We just need to accept the challenge and start thinking interconnectedly, start thinking circular now. <laughs> Unfortunately, lawmakers haven't done that yet. They're just looking at a tiny fraction of the challenge ahead. If you shy away from the whole extent of the problem, you won't solve it. So Architects for Future is trying to change that by talking to policymakers. Just yesterday, news came out that the German Climate Protection Act isn't enough to actually save our climate. Also, the economy is playing a big role. In order to facilitate the transition towards a social and sustainable way of life within the planetary boundaries, we need to enact a framework of policies that does. Life cycle assessment is an important element and so is sufficiency. And to build our future within the framework, we need skilled actors who know how to think outside the box how to get to sustainable solutions and how to implement them. And last but not least, transitioning in the field of construction means building our future together as a society, not to build any arbitrary future for society. That's why we do a lot of networking and PR, basically talking to people. <laughs> And that's why we petitioned for a transition towards a sustainable building and got hurt. That's why we won't run out of work anytime soon. We need to address the elephant in the room. That is the climate impact of buildings. We need to rethink how we construct and how we build. We need to refuse the status quo. We need to start reducing the problem to a size that is actually manageable. We need to reuse as much of the materials we use as possible. We need to replace the ones with sustainable alternatives that are replaceable. And we need to recycle the rest. And in the end, we need to remedy all the damages that we've done nevertheless. 
Together we can transition. Let's start now. This is where you can find us and how you can reach us. Very glad to hear from you all. And now have fun with the other pre presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, thanks for this. Um, and this is, yeah, actually where we, we head into the core presentations of uh, today web, today's web seminar. Um, I'm sorry, I had no chance to, um, to observe the chat. Uh, so, yeah, pl yeah. Um, there's just a remark about muting your microphone. So, yeah, if you notice um, you have any background noise, um, then please mute yourselves because it's hard to listen to presenters. Um, that's a good reminder. Thanks for that. Um, yes. So, yeah, let's move on to our first speaker today. Um, and I would like to welcome uh, Gerhard Koch, um, who's been director of the Austrian Association of Clay Brick Manufacturers since 1994. Um, he has many years of experience in the construction, uh, construction sector, uh, which ranges from R&D to marketing and PR and advocacy. Um, at Wiener Berger AG, he's played a central role in implementing a structured sustainability management as well. Um, and today, today he will share his experiences with us in his presentation titled uh, Bricks, Tradition and Future. Uh, it's very interesting. And yeah, you're sharing your screen already, Mr. Koch. Thanks for being with us today. And yeah, handing over the word to you. Thank you, Katharina, for the kind introduction. Well, um, the topic I'm talking about today is Bricks, tradition and future. And um, I have chosen four topics to address. First, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of clay products. Then, because maybe not everybody uh, here in the webinar is so familiar uh, with how these products are in fact uh, produced, I will inform you a little bit about the production process. Then I will uh, step a little bit into what types of bricks and roof tiles in, do actually exist. And last but not least, and of course um, for us as well as all our guests, I believe the most important topic, um, uh, I will talk about sustainability uh, of bricks and roof tiles. So history, I mean, um, maybe all of you um, have played a little bit with earth and mud in the past when you were children. This is something very close to us, close to our heart. And um, it's already more than 5,000 years ago that uh, people started to make construction products out of earth clay. Um, and they have combined this clay with, um, with water and have started to fire it to make a durable product out of it. And um, a little time schedule here goes back to the uh, fourth millennium before Christ in Mesopotamia, the famous temple buildings in Uruk. They are the maybe the oldest um, brick buildings we can still find, the Tower of Babel a little bit later, 2000 before Christ, or the famous Ishtar gate um, from King Nebuchadnezzar. Or if we go to a more recent um, past, the Roman Empire, um, they started to build vaults out of bricks. And uh, in fact, it, it were the Romans who brought bricks, fired bricks um, to the whole of Europe. Um, and uh, also in China, there is um, a lot of uh, development in the past and the Great Wall uh, is um, to a large extent built uh, with clay bricks as well. Or another example, the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. Um, also in more recent
Um, excuse ah, me. sorry, Mr. Koch. Somebody muted me. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, that was uh, an accident. Sorry about that. Also, in more recent times, there is a lot of interesting brick buildings, both in uh, civil engineering and in housing construction. You see here a few examples. Bridges on the left top corner, you see the Goldstein Bridge in, in Saxonia and the middle Brooklyn Bridge in New York or Hamburg. The three lower examples are from uh, Vienna, in fact. Many non-residential building, like uh, the right down corner, this is the so-called Arsenal, a military building in Vienna, or the water towers, um, churches, office buildings. So quite a long tradition, and we believe for good reason. Um, yes, a few words about how these bricks are produced. Here in this sketch, you see the overview. It starts with mining, digging clay out of the earth. Preparation, shaping, drying, you get to, uh, need to get the water out of the clay, firing, packaging, shipment. Um, I will show you a little bit more in detail those steps. It starts all with the clay mining, so digging clay out of uh, the soil. Clay and loam are usually the materials being used, and they uh, consist of, um, of clay minerals. You see here the most important ones like kaolinite and montmorillonite. The clay is normally extracted by means of excavators and then deposited in intermediate dumps, first of all, for the purpose of stock stockpiling, but it's also the first step of the so-called clay preparation. I come to that, what it means. And from there, from this external stock, the material is then uh, transported by different uh, means into the production. Um, and again, in big box feeders from where the material is then taken out for the next step, which is, in fact, the preparation. Preparation uh, means to, to uh, split up the bigger parts of this clay and to get a, um, a, a moistening, which is equally distributed um, a, in the material. And um, for this uh, preparation, you normally use different machines. Uh, we call them pen grinder, roller mills, and some others as well, which crush, mix, and break down uh, the clay as it comes from the clay pit. And after that preparation, going through the machines, the material rests for another, let's say, two weeks in big storages to further develop and to become ready for production. In some cases, we add organic material, so-called pore forming materials like sawdust, which leave then later in the firing process, little air pores in the clay, um, and thus improve the thermal insulation properties of the clay blocks. The next step is the shaping, where our products get their final shape. And there are two principal possibilities, normally for bricks, facing bricks, pavers, or for blocks, and also for part of the roof tile types. The production methodology um, is extrusion. The clay is pressed through a die where it gets the form, the shape. And after this die, the bricks or blocks are cut in pieces. For clay roof tiles, there is also an alternative methodology. They can get their shape also in a so-called revolver press with molds. You see that here on the uh, right picture. After that comes the maybe most important step uh, in the production process. As I said, you need to get uh, the water out of the wet products. So there, this is done in two steps. They are first dried, and then in the second step, fired. Um, and that is done in, on uh, pellets or plates where first the bricks uh, go through the dryer. The warm air uh, used for drying the bricks normally uh, is excess heat from the kiln. So the dryers are not separately heated. They use the excess heat from the kiln. And after the drying, the bricks are unloaded and reloaded again 
um, on kiln cars and go through the kiln where they are fired um, at temperatures between, let's say, around about 800 degrees for clay blocks up to 1200 degrees uh, for roof tiles. And then at the end of the kiln, they are cooled down again. So they come out at warm and hand warm uh, temperature. Normally, uh, what is used today are so-called tunnel kilns, where the bricks go through the kiln. Last step, of course, the uh, fired products are unloaded from the kiln cars and uh, fed into a pelletizing and packaging machine and then brought uh, to our stockyard, uh, where from they are then transported di either directly to construction site or to building material suppliers. So what product types do exist? Here in this sketch, you see a, a little overview. From roof tiles to clay blocks for load bearing and for non-load bearing walls, to facing products for facades, be it either in the form of bricks, as you see them here, or thinner uh, plate type materials, down to clay pavers, which are used for terraces and in the garden. A bit more in detail, clay blocks, they have the biggest function to fulfill. They fulfill a load bearing function as well as a physical function. And of course, our favorite and our top products are single shell monolithic blocks, which do not need any additional thermal insulation layer they fulfill all requirements from acoustic performance, thermal insulation to load bearing function in one relatively thick layer. Of course, there also exist thinner clay blocks, which are then combined either with a clay facade, so-called cavity walls, where an insulation is normally between the two layers of clay bricks, or with an external uh, composite thermal insulating system. What our opinion is that these um, clay blocks are very important for the indoor air quality in buildings. They provide a healthy indoor climate. There is no emittance of harmful substances. Um, they have a damping functions for the varying temperatures outside. And they have a huge contribution to the energy efficiency of buildings. Nowadays, with uh, our top products, and I guess my colleague Mario Kubista will show you some of these products later in his presentation, we can reach any energy efficiency standard required. Nearly zero energy building is no problem with such monolithic blocks. They are normally used for family homes and flats, and sometimes also in office buildings, hospitals, non-residential buildings. Facing bricks, they have mainly an aesthetical function, but also the role to protect the building from the environment, from weather conditions. And they are produced across Europe in different colors, shapes, and surface structures. So it's mainly something to decide for aesthetical reason, what sort of facing brick, what surface type, what color um, you prefer. Um, these products are nowadays becoming thinner and thinner to improve material efficiency. So brick slips or eco bricks, which are thinner than a normal brick, become more and more uh, popular. And of course, they um, contribute significantly to the um, carbon um, emission footprint uh, of these products. If you have less material, of course, you also reduce the footprint. Then we have the roof tiles. Again, different colors, different shapes, different surfaces. Sometimes they are covered with a glazing or with an engobe. They have mainly aesthetical function and, of course, a super function to protect the house against um, the weather conditions. And these pitched roofs where you use clay roof tiles, they have a lot of advantages also 
uh, from the perspective of the usage of the building. And then last but not least, clay pavers, aesthetical purpose to design your garden, your private area for terraces, for walls in your garden, etc. And the, again, they come in different colors, shapes, and surface uh, structures. They are also used in public areas, for example, in pedestrian zones in towns, and for example, in England, even used for road building. Yeah, I come to the probably most important part of my presentation. I want to show you the five environmental commitments of our industry. And they are fully in line with the strategy of the European Union, and I guess also fully in line um, with the goals of Nature Plus uh, as a labeling organization. First of all, decarbonization of the product portfolio, then circular economy, biodiversity, healthy indoor air, and regional production. Those are our five priorities, and I'll show you a bit more what that means. Decarbonization. Of course, it is our utmost goal to fulfill the role, uh, the, the, the goal of the um, EU Green Deal to decarbonize, fully decarbonize um, Europe until 2050. So it's also our goal to become carbon neutral by 2050. And we are absolutely convinced it is possible and we will do it, we will reach it. And there are uh, some major topics to be dealt with and a lot of research and development is going on at the moment and first steps are already being made. First of all, a continuous efficiency improvement to use heat recovery, heat pump technology to dematerialize products, to make them slimmer, use less material and therefore have less material to be fired. Then second step to replace fossil fuel. Nowadays, we mainly use natural gas and in principle, it's possible and first pilots are being done to replace this fossil fuel by green fuels, green gas or hydrogen. And the second possibility is to build electric kilns where the necessary energy to heat, to fire the products is provided by electricity. Of course, this only makes sense if it's green electricity. And last but not least, we have a second source of CO2 in our product, that's the raw materials. They contain carbonates and these carbonates split up during firing. Um, and of course, we also have to do something against these CO2 emissions and there are options and there are projects also on that. We have to switch to alternative raw materials containing less carbonates and apply innovative production technologies. One example I want to show you, a factory in, in Austria, Plant Uttendorf, where a first step has been made, a heat pump has been installed, which led to a 30% reduction of uh, specific gas consum consumption, and by that is a reduction of CO2 output also by 30% which is around about 2000 tons of CO2 a year, which we could, uh, emit now less. Four if, minutes, Mr. Koch. <laughs> thank you. If we would uh, roll that out um, to all our plants, the potential would be roughly 400,000 tons of CO2 a year. Another point I already mentioned, the dematerialization use of thinner bricks compared to the traditional brick, less material means less uh, firing less energy needed, and you see here another big potential for Wienerberger to reduce 200,000 tons a year. And that's just Wienerberger. If you take the whole brick and block market in Europe, it's even more. Second topic, encourage circular economy. I have, because of timing, to speed up a little bit. I can only say, given the nature of fired clay, uh, it's no problem to reuse or recycle after the end of life stage. And a lot of ideas, a lot of projects are at the moment going on to facilitate that. Just a few points to be mentioned. We can use recycling material internally in the production of new products. We can recycle wastewater from our own processes or from other processes. We can further optimize the production design. And for that, for example, we use, use finite element technology 
we can optimize our raw material selection and so on and so on. There are a lot of options. Third point, biodiversity. The restoration of clay pits and the preservation of biodiversity in those clay pits, that's uh, very much to our heart. And that's in fact what is uh, frequently done in every brick plant around in Europe. And we can say with that being done, we create new living habitats for many um, endangered species. Um, and in fact, such an old clay pit, you see here a nice photo in the middle becomes a, a new uh, and, and uh, worthful, valuable um, um, living habitat for, for many uh, rare species. Healthy indoor air quality, I've already mentioned. Um, so I go through the re regional production. Um, this is, we believe, very important because bricks are a regional building material. And therefore, we don't need a lot of transport. And uh, if, if we only provide our local customers, of course, we save a lot of energy and CO2 because we have very low transport uh, uh, needs. Uh, to round all that up, um, I want to show you a video, which um, I believe shows all what I have said in a nice form. Die Liebe zur Natur und das Gespür für Natürlichkeit geben wir von Generation zu Generation weiter. Genau wie das Gefühl, zufrieden in ein wertbeständiges und sicheres Zuhause zu kommen. Es ist an der Zeit, Entscheidungen zu treffen, damit wir unsere Natur schützen und der Zukunft eine echte Chance geben. Und das mit dem natürlichsten Baustoff überhaupt, mit dem für Generationen gemachten Ziegel. Denn der Ziegel ist ein Material direkt aus der Natur. 100% natürlich. Aus den Elementen Tonerde, Wasser, Luft und Feuer. Der wertvolle Rohstoff Tonerde wird regional und umweltverträglich am Werksgelände der Ziegelhersteller abgebaut. Über die Beschicker gelangen Tonerde, Wasser, Porosierungsmaterial wie unbehandeltes Sägemehl oder Zellulosefasern und Recyclingmaterial aus der Planziegelbearbeitung in den Kollergang. Dort wird die Tonerde durch tonnenschwere Stahlwalzen zerkleinert. Die korngroßen Stücke kommen in das Sumpfhaus, wo sie bis zu einer Woche lang gelagert und somit gleichmäßig durchfeuchtet werden. In der Vakuumpresse wird die aufbereitete Tonerde durch ein Mundstück gedrückt. So erhält der Ziegel sein charakteristisches Lochmuster. Der Ziegelabschneider trennt die einzelnen Ziegel vom Strang ab und separiert die Grünlinge voneinander. Nach der Trocknung mit Kühlluft aus der Produktion gelangen sie in den Brennofen, wo die beigemischten Porosierungsmittel feine Luftbohren schaffen. So kann der Ziegel später optimal Wärme dämmen. Im Brennofen wird das individuelle Muster für Generationen verewigt und der Ziegel erhält seine rote Farbe. Das Lochmuster ist ein technisches Meisterwerk und verleiht dem Ziegel seine einzigartigen Eigenschaften. Langlebigkeit, behagliches Wohnen und Nachhaltigkeit. Nach dem Auskühlen werden die Planziegel noch geschliffen, damit sie später, wie der Name schon sagt, Plan auflegen. Dann werden die Ziegel transportfertig gemacht und kommen auf kürzestem Weg genau dorthin, wo sie neuen Lebensraum schaffen, uns zu jeder Jahreszeit ein behagliches und gesundes Raumklima schenken und die Verantwortung der Zukunft stabil tragen. Was passiert mit der Lehmgrube? Wir geben der Natur ihren ursprünglichen Lebensraum zurück und schaffen so einen natürlichen Kreislauf. Wer mit Ziegeln baut, trägt Verantwortung für den Klimaschutz und die Artenvielfalt. So können wir mehr an unsere Kinder weitergeben. Natürlich Ziegel. Die Liebe zur Natur. Um, so I apologize for uh, the text being in German, but I guess the pictures were speaking for themselves. Um, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. And of course, I uh, will be there later in the question and answer session. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Koch. Um, yeah, there's already um, a lively discussion going on in the chat. So I would like to draw everybody's attention to the chat uh, column. Take a look if you haven't yet. Um, there's also a few questions already to you, Mr. Koch, and we will note them down um, for later. But now um, let's continue with our presentations and our next speaker that I'd like to welcome is uh, Doris Wirth. Uh, she has been running the Vienna-based consulting company BlueSafe for 20 years, uh, specializing in technical services for property managers. Uh, Doris Wirth is also active beyond her own business, uh, for example, as vice president of uh, Vienna Engineers, or as member of the professional group uh, committee of Vienna engineering offices. And today she will share her insights uh, with us in her presentation with the very straightforward title, The Brick. <laughs> so I'm handing over to you, Mrs. Witt, you are still muted. So feel free yes. to unmute yourself and share your screen. Katharina, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Hello, everybody. I'm very, very happy to present the brick. Uh, it's not just one piece of brick, it's a building in Vienna. And surprise, surprise, it's the headquarter uh, of uh, the company Wiener Berger, uh, who is a main producer or the world leader, world leading producer of bricks. And um, I may share my uh, presentation. I hope everybody can see it. Can I have a nod, uh, Katrina? Yes, 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 it's working. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Perfectly. So um, uh, here, a uh, short introduction. I'm also a DGMB and ÖGNI auditor. Um, DGMB, as I saw before, is also a member or, or a sponsoring partner, whatever partner for Nature Plus and also for the Architects for Future. Uh, so DGMB um, and ÖGNI, they are very, um, um, they are on their way to help building industry, real estate industry, uh, to get more sustainable, to provide certification systems, but also to provide consultancy um, so that the real estate industry can uh, improve in, in um, matters of sustainability. Um, yes, so um, this is our team. Uh, we are all, we are young and old professionals, very nicely mixed. It's a pleasure to work with in Blue Safe. Um, we do buildings. Uh, we have done a lot of things, a lot of square meters in refurbishment, in auditing. We do a lot of audits, sustainability audits. Uh, also technical due diligence and energy performance certificates. So we really are um, in the hardcore business of uh, real estate design and um, to and, and real estate improvement, especially. So, but now let's talk about the brick. The brick uh, is uh, the main quarter of Wienerberger in Vienna. Um, it was built, uh, it was uh, just finished um, last year. Uh, it was commissioned last year and this is it. It's uh, a real, a very nice and sustainable building as I will point out later. Uh, we have about approximately 24,000 office space, uh, 103,050 workplaces, not all of them occupied currently due to um, the very well known COVID um, uh, pandemic. So a lot of home office, but uh, the building is very, very uh, flexible. And so it can also answer needs in these special times. Uh, we have 835 square meters re retail space. Uh, we have an adjacent hotel uh, with 152 guest rooms and approximately 400 square meters of restaurant and catering so that everybody can feel well and also get um, fed during working. Um, we were contracted by Sora Villa, uh, who is the project owner and developer uh, of the BRIC, and we were contracted as sustainability auditors according to UGNI and DGND, which was really a pleasure working for them. Um, and, uh, but right in 2018, when the building was started, uh, the, bu the, the building process was started, or the tearing down of the old building was started, let's say, um, the 
uh, whole site was sold to the Vienna Insurance Group. Um, and uh, Wiener, Berger asked, uh, Wiener Berger made the contracts to be the main tenant of the building. So what's very special about the building is that the tenant, the later tenant, was involved from the very, very beginning uh, concerning uh, quality, sustainability, uh, um, um, the, um, everything about the building, um, and especially the qualities uh, for their for the work uh, workplaces. Um, and this is one of a very nice requirement if you are an auditor and the later user is involved from the very beginning, then it's very, very nice working because you have a very, very clear um, um, target uh, to, to, to follow. And uh, Wiener Berger from the very beginning asked to have a DGMB gold certificate at least. Um, according to uh, DGMB, uh, we we test uh, we audited all the different qualities that go with a, with such a certificate, like environmental quality, economic, social, cultural, and functional quality, technical quality, process quality, and also of course the site. Uh, we uh, looked at uh, altogether sixty one criteria. Uh, Forty eight of them are, um, are active and interconnected, with a different weighing and uh, the. Uh, uh, documentation that goes with it, and here you have the result. Uh, we did not even um, have we did not have gold. No, we had platinum, and uh, due to the fact that um, uh, Wiener Berger, with their very clear understanding of what they want to get in the end uh, um, with the building, uh, we had a very very high uh, score in the social, cultural, and functional quality of the building, which gave us the Ögni Kristall the diamond um, of um, as, as a very, very high uh, um, declaration for user satisfaction in the building. And why is that? Um, let me show you first the situation of the building within Vienna. You have here, um, I hope you can see the cursor. Here is the center of Vienna. Here you have uh, Belvedere, Schönbrunn, and here uh, in this area is the brick. Um, here you can see uh, a closer picture of the brick. We look at this building here in turquoise color. Um, this is the hotel and here, uh, hotel and um, part one. This is office part two and this is office part three. In this office block three, this is the headquarters now of uh, Nina Berger. And what you see adjacent here is uh, the biotope city a development uh, for um, uh, more than 900, no, no, excuse me. I think it's more than uh, 500 apartments in, in the pilot of city or maybe even more. Um, they uh, have, so it's living, it's residential, uh, mixed with office structure, mixed with uh, shopping, retail, and uh, of course, all the different infrastructure around uh, very close by, like schools and um, and administration. Um, so uh, when we when we look at this, you can see here is Wienerberg. Wienerberg uh, used to be the area in Vienna where the clay mines were 100 and 150 years ago, as we heard from Mr. Koch. This place has a very very long brick tradition, clay and brick tradition. Um, of course, also uh, combined with uh, not very nice working conditions 100 years ago, uh, but still it is a traditional place uh, to build the, Vien the Wienerberger headquarters. And uh, as you can see here, these are, here is re-retinated, re renatured uh, clay um, mining. Um, some, you can see some structures still and also some ponds uh, which have been filled with water after uh, the clay mining was abandoned in this area. And on this, um, the former, this, all, all of this here is a brownfield development. Before uh, Coca-Cola grounds were here, Coca-Cola production facilities, they were torn down. Um, part of uh, some production facilities you can still see here. And uh, this, uh, the, the, the whole uh, complex here was taken down and the, the rubble of the, of the former buildings was used on the site uh, 
for paving for um, for the, the basements for the garage making and so on. So it's really also from the recycling point of view, a very nice brownfield development. Even everything is green now. Um, here you have the brick uh, as a site. Uh, here is uh, the here, here is the hotel on the left hand side in the middle an office part and on the right hand side the Vienna uh, the Wiener Berger headquarters. Uh, you can see uh, this is the the building um, as it was planned uh, with a hidden entrance. Uh, I put an arrow here. Here you walk into the building. You hardly see it. Uh, so this is the entrance situation in the south, and you can see also that the whole building provides screening uh, because uh, it, it's part of the biotope city, so um, all the buildings here have to be greened, all the rooftops have to be greened, um, and you can see throws on the facade here, uh, they are made for little trees, and also uh, this building here for ranking uh, greens on the facade. So. Uh, it is a very, it, it will be not only in red brick, it will be a red green building very soon. Um, let's look at the left part. I will click through um, uh, the areas. Uh, the, I will click through the design just a little bit uh, so that you get a feeling how the, build, how the building was built. Uh, all the green um, walls are concrete structures. It's not built of brick, of course, because it is it has nine stories. So uh, it was um, built as a as a as a um, how do you say armored steel structure. And um, these are this is the we said not the Bauteile, also uh, carrying. The, the structure, the, the steel structure, steel or concrete steel structure, um, and here all the diff, all the, the the walls in between. Uh, when we go to level one and level two, uh, as you can see, there are hardly any uh, partitioning walls, um, so the structure is held to a minimum, uh, so that the, the the building can be used in a very very flexible way. Um, let's go back here on level one. What you can see here is the hotel with a very, very big portal to enter the biotope city in the back with all the flats, with those 500, 600 flats, which are already built, and some more will follow. Um, and when we go to level two on three, here you can see the area above this, um, this big portal. Uh, here is the hotel reception. And when we go to level four and five, then you can see the rooms, uh, the guest rooms. Uh, when we look at this building, this is an office building for rent uh, for third parties, not Wiener Berger, not for Solavia, but simply for third companies. And uh, we can go now to the second part, to the southern part. Um, just for orientation, we have in the in the left, we have north in the in on the on the right, we have south. Um, so the second part where Wiener Berger is uh, the main tenant, uh, we go again from the, from the third level underground with parking lots and, um, uh, yeah, and technical um, installations up to level minus one, where we have the entrance and the lobby. So this is uh, one story below everything else. And uh, when we go to level zero, we already have office rooms uh, nicely uh, grouped around this center um, access uh, um, point where, where all the elevators are and also the, the central staircases. Um, when we go up, uh, you can see hardly any partitioning walls all the installations are in the raised floor. We don't need any, we, we can, these, these, uh, these walls, they are just uh, as a suggestion, they can be left out or they can be used uh, or can be easily removed. So we have a very, very generous office uh, concept, very innovative uh, and flexible to whatever is needed. And when we go to the top, 
uh, everywhere we have also balconies and and um, terraces. And on the rooftop, we have a green, a very nicely greened roof. Uh, under the roof here in the south, there is a nice atrium, um, which is uh, open. This is an open space, and it has a beautiful view to the south of Vienna to Schneeberg. So this is uh, uh, how the building is shown upright. So here you see the facade of the hotel with the big portal here in the on, on the bottom uh, to the biotope city. The whole building is 35 meters high and you can see the throws for um, planting uh, and uh, even small trees can be planted in those uh, in those baskets. So, and so let's look at the finished building, not only at the design. Um, uh, this is the entrance, which I just showed to you. And the whole building is very, is highly responsive to ecological criteria. Uh, when we look at the building as a whole, we have a low energy building with a green rooftop and an atrium on top. Uh, we have a sustainable clinker facade with ranking plants and throws for small trees. We have low life cycle costs altogether. Uh, we calculated life cycle costs for 50 years. And as you know, that uh, looks also at the operational costs, including uh, tearing down the building and recycling it. Um, so end of life uh, phase as well. Um, and of course, the construction phase. And uh, what is very um, interesting with that building, we have very, very low maintenance costs. One, one reason is also the nice facade with the clinker, uh, which I will refer to a little bit later. We have ecologically friendly building materials. We had a very, very strict management of chemicals on construction site. Um, whoever hires us as auditors, as uh, sustainability auditors, uh, will have to commit themselves to quality stage four uh, uh, concerning the building materials. So every single building material that goes on the site um, has to be checked by us and uh, validated before it can be built in, in the building. Uh, and we have here a very, very strict management. So what we can do, we can guarantee that there is no, uh, there are no substances of doing harm to the people in the building no uh, volatile organic substances or form aldehydes and, and things like that. Uh, we also have a very high area efficiency. So the room has been used- Four minutes. Four minutes, thank you. Yes. Has been used very efficiently. Uh, we have the recycling of rubble of warmer buildings directly on the site uh, that was built in into the pavements, into uh, all the, the outdoor, um, outdoor equipment and, and the area. And um, yes, and of course we have a green facade, which is also very important for the energy efficiency of the building, especially in the summer. And uh, we have very, very many, um, very, very many criteria answering uh, user friendliness and user satisfaction. It's a user-centered design. And when I go through the pictures here, you can see how flexible, how free um, the office space is. We have a lot of communication everywhere, pos uh, uh, communication possibilities everywhere, quiet and relaxed zones, a nice lobby with access points and security. We have uh, even the elevators are designed nicely. Uh, here we have inner staircases. Um, this is a mirror here. It's not as, as uh, wide here, it's a mirror, but it, a lot of tricks also to make you feel well, design tricks. Outer space, a lot of outer space in every store. We have balconies like this where people can come together and sit outside. Uh, we have the atrium on top. We have phone cells and privacy boxes. And one of the highlights for today, the Terka Klinke bricks, um, they optimize the EU value of the building shell and have an excellent contribution to noise protection of the facade. Uh, here is the building shell structure. You have here the reinforced concrete. You have the stone wall. You have the rear ventilation here for four centimeters and 11.5 uh, centimeter clinker brick. Um, so, and the clinker brick contributes to Ögni platinum uh, simply 
due to the lower life cycle costs. Um, sorry, that should be a Y here, typo. Um, and the, the, the protection of the, of the underlying stone wool, low maintenance costs, easy cleaning, almost no aging. And if it ages, it's very noble aging. We like that. We like all the churches with all these clinker bricks. Uh, they still look like new um, and uh, noble new, noble aged, whatever. And uh, of course, this clinker brick is also identity forming. It's a landmarking. Uh, if you have a building of nine story, stories with clinker bricks, it's simply a landmark that you do, that you form. And uh, the ecological footprint, of course, you have an energy, an average energy demand in production. The footprint is not so small, not so small um, uh, when we look at the production as we heard before. Um, but still the pollutions during the, the high-tech processes, they are getting lower and lower as technologies uh, uh, progresses, progress. Uh, we have a low energy demand in transport because it's normally always a regional clay mining and produ production. And we have a very, very high, and that's very important, a very high recycling potential uh, due to the multi-shell construction of the facade. And I think that makes the brick and also the clinker bricks um, um, a material of the future. So ready for questions? And I hope I made the time. Very good. You're on point. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, if you have any questions, everyone uh, note them down in the chat or note them down in front of you so you can raise your hand later on in the Q&A. Uh, for now, um, congratulations, everyone. I will, um, you mastered the first half <laughs> of this web seminar today. Um, uh, may, I, may I answer a question directly? Uh, no, sorry, uh, because yeah, but you will get your you will get your chance. We will note it down. I saw that there is a question in in the chat, but um, yeah, uh, keep in mind your answer. Uh, all right, so I hope you can see my screen again. Um, so with this, we yeah, we're pretty much um, at half time now, and um, we will make. Uh, take a bit of a break, uh, 10 minutes uh, to be more precise, and it's working out really nicely because it's 11.10 now on my clock. So I will see you back at 11.20. Um, yeah, get some fresh air, get some coffee, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. I hope everything, everyone made it back um, after a break. I hope you enjoyed your break. Um, had the opportunity to get some refreshments, um, especially just checking if um, Mr. Vermeulen, are you here already? Are you back already before we enter? Um, into our I, I am back. I switched on the mic and the camera. Very good. Okay, good. I just wanted to check. Um, um, all right. So, um, yeah, welcome back, everyone. Um, we have three more presentations to look forward to today, and then the um, often mentioned Q and A and discussion in the end. So let's not waste any time, um, and let's welcome um, Paul Vermeulen from Belgium. He's an architect, researcher, and publicist, and is very active in uh, preserving architectural heritage. For example, as chairman of the Quality Chamber of Monuments and Architecture, Ghent, um, as part of the design research team of the AI, IABR Atelier Utrecht, he contributed his experiences in the project The Healthy City. Um, so yeah, welcome, Mr. Vermeulen. And with this, I'm handing over to you and your presentation on the Office Building Flemish Environment Agency. So I'll stop my presentation. You can just start sharing your screen. Sorry. So now you should see the presentation. Is that uh, yes. okay for everybody? Also in full screen, everything's perfect. Uh, thank you, Katharina, for uh, introducing me. Uh, on the first slide, you see a few uh, figures and facts about the building I am going to present to you. I'm going to do this from a, a designer, uh, a designer perspective. I'm uh, one of the designers uh, partners 
of the Smet Vermeulen Architect, and also a professor in a design professor at the architectural uh, faculty of TU Delft. So don't expect uh, figures. Uh, don't expect me to talk numbers. I will talk uh, architecture. Um, you may think a building that was delivered in 2005 and where studies started uh, a lot earlier, how can that still be relevant? It's a good question because of course, uh, protocols for airtight building, uh, for better insulation performance, for uh, uh, making use of renewable energies were uh, largely unavailable at that time. So we are doing on all these levels much better now than we did then. Still, I think it could be uh, considered and uh, as it was at the time uh, when it was built and when it uh, got a few awards, it could still be considered um, a standard for a sustainable building, for all over st sustainable building in uh, making uh, an, uh, a conscious uh, use of the resources. The resource uh, focusing on today is a brick, and I took the liberty to uh, expand that to uh, more resources, to all resources, one of which would be uh, space, space in general. And then the first question, of course, when we build is, where should we build? Uh, in this uh, case, we uh, uh, found a site that was uh, on a walking distance from the uh, train uh, station in Alst, which is a small city in between uh, Ghent and uh, Brussels, in a large building block hatched over there. You can see it. Uh, that was uh, that used to be the home of a hospital that was uh, not in use anymore and that lost its consistency. These are pictures of uh, the early uh, days of the project when we found it. You see uh, between some of the buildings uh, parking lots, uh, chaotic parking and uh, buildings in a bad shape. The ones to the right would become the site where we eventually would build. You can see it uh, over here. Uh, it uh, consisted of, um, of a garden on the street, a vicar's house and an elderly home that was in a bad shape. The other buildings colored were, used, uh, were in use by the OCMW, which is the welfare uh, company of Alst, uh, that also participated in the project. So we, uh, we decided to uh, take the site of the elderly home as our building site, preserving the garden, preserving the vicar's house. And these were the main answers to the next important question on what we have to keep. This is the reason why we thought it was worth keeping the interface with the street, the interface with this popular neighborhood where we were going to build was actually this uh, neo-Gothic uh, house with some heritage uh, value, not really a monument, but still. Uh, on the street, the, the fence, uh, brick, uh, bluestone and uh, ironwork, uh, fence that uh, uh, separated the garden from the street, and most of all, uh, a tree, a chestnut tree, as old as the buildings were, and we thought this was the real heritage. Hence the presence of a dendrologist who did a, an excellent job in the project team. So what we really thought was that what could be revived was the relationship the previous building, the one we demolished, had with the Vickery. The program was uh, um, had two parts. There was uh, next to an office building, which we built anew, also a documentation center that would perfectly fit the Vickers house. So that was why we could uh, use it and regroup um, the old and the new buildings joined by an entrance pavilion around the garden. The garden uh, um, uh, mostly characterized by this uh, monumental chestnut tree. There is a, a medallion on the chestnut tree, 
which is a work of art, a work of art uh, which also includes the little uh, uh, pool you see here, also the pump. Uh, the, uh, the work of art is about uh, cycles of life, the birds who would visit this uh, tree. And they are a work of art by uh, Patrick van Kakenberg. Uh, if you don't know the man, please check out his work. Best thing would be to come to the Gent Museum of Fine Arts and see what he does. He was, uh, he was uh, an evident choice for this uh, commission since he knew the site. His grandpa lived in the building that we demolished. He was from Aalst and he's, all of his work is about life cycles in a more philosophical and bricoleur-like uh, approach. Um, a lot was kept, but there was also demolishment. So some of the rubble stayed in place. Uh, it is uh, grown over with uh, plants at this point, but we made a rubble tree at some, uh, at some uh, uh, parts of the site. Uh, other reuses were um, uh, taking a brick, uh, brick um, rubble as um, the aggregate in concrete. This was a project that then was pioneering and uh, followed up by the VTCB, which is the Scientific and Technical Center for Building Industries in Belgium. The important, the most important thing in the project was making a garden for the street. You can see here why. It is not a very, uh, a very wealthy street. It is uh, all very modest. The garden was the delight of it. And we thought it was uh, self-evident to make it uh, uh, accessible to the public. And the VMM staff was uh, uh, enhancing that idea with suggesting to have a herb uh, garden. They had all the knowledge for doing this uh, that was uh, freely accessible for uh, neighbors. They could enter the gate and pick the herbs they would need. And it was done. Uh, another picture also involving the greenery on the lower roof. The higher roof was used for solar paneling. Um, as you can see on the uh, isometric uh, above, next to the garden, to the left of the vicar's house, was um, an, a new path, a new path crossing this uh, very large uh, building block. A path that, as you can see here, uh, had two levels, one for pedestrians going uh, along the building, uh, passing by the entrance pavilion, another one going down uh, into a parking garage and a cycling garage. If you would enter that uh, gate below uh, and you go to the right, you, you could park your bike and be with a staircase or the elevator immediately up in the entrance area. Cars go down uh, more deeply into the second underground layer under the uh, square, not the garden, square. Uh, the first layer was used for another car park, uh, providing the Ocean Way buildings, which you can see here in the left in the picture, uh, with a car, car park and then liberating this area that used to be uh, a chaotic uh, car park before. Um, the path uh, 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 crosses the, the entrance pavilion, uh, the public areas of the building and the public areas of the public domain uh, go along with each other. And then changing the perspective or rather changing the isometric view and looking from the other side from the more mineral uh, the more mineral square the former parking area where now the car parks are underground the boulders that you see on the foreground were to indicate where on this square uh, fire engines could uh, could uh, drive and not. And it was also provided as a sort of a setting 
for youngsters, there were many in the social housing uh, nearby. You see it to the right of the picture there. We also provided them with a hangout uh, canopy in this uh, uh, small glazed structure that you see in the end, providing a second a car entrance. So they were, uh, this gave entrance to the first underground car park. We hoped that uh, since the railway station was quite near, uh, the uh, the car park of the uh, of the environmental agency could later be used by building uh, by uh, neighbors instead of uh, staff, and that's why two of the uh, the two uh, uh, parking levels have separate entrances. This is the plan uh, combining uh, all this: the garden for trees, for water infiltration, for herbs the mineral uh, uh, square on the other side covering the car park. I think you will hear a few in my presentation, a few echoes of what uh, Mrs. Uh, Wirtz also uh, uh, mentioned. Um, the first thing we tried was to reduce the size of the building by clustering functions and making areas of double use. So a first decision in that was to situate the entrance pavilion in between the two main uh, functions, which reduced, of course, circulation space. But then this uh, circulation space immediately gave, uh, gave way to the dining area. That also had a view on the main staircase and uh, staircase entering the office uh, building. And furthermore, also provided entrance to an auditorium that was only occasionally used. Therefore, it was glazed so that it could contribute to the spatial, uh, to the spatial feel of that uh, entrance area that is in itself quite small. But the uh, other, other uh, the conference rooms, uh, speaking parlors, also uh, in a transparent uh, continuity with it. And so here is uh, um, support for my claim here. So only this here is the public area. All the rest was, uh, well, was simply the office, the office uh, floors. So quite a compact and still very spacious um, um, entrance and a public area to the building. Transparencies, of course, then could be uh, could be regulated with the simplest means available, uh, that is curtains. We made an open structure. We uh, paid a lot of attention to dimensional uh, dimensional consistency, which uh, in the end provided a flexible and adaptable building. So actually, this was what we delivered: a building with two facades some additional structure and hardly any uh, separations in between. Uh, all that was to be done with uh, lightweight, uh, with lightweight uh, infill, such as uh, panel walls and uh, file, uh, filing cabinets, uh, cupboards actually, two-sided uh, on what would be a corridor, uh, providing uh, a fixed pattern of lightings uh, light fittings was uh, also part of the deal. Um, a number of uh, um, uh, um, cable areas uh, integrated into the floor would also provide for a uh, maximum flexibility with actually a very low tech means. So you could uh, position these, uh, uh, these uh, partition walls in any positions often um, changes have already been made. And I think this is the smallest unit available, which has all of the, all of the things I said before. And in, a, in with, with a, a, a great attention for acoustics, which was of course a challenge in a building that was only, uh, only floors and ceilings. 
Um, I think by now you saw on the slides uh, quite a number of materials, uh, also high standards for having them sound uh, without any uh, harmful emissions uh, was, uh, was in the uh, building uh, integrated into the building process. And we try to use all of them in the right places. So uh, structural elements where they should, subdivisions where they should, etc. So in the end, you could ask yourself uh, why presenting this, uh, this building in a seminar on bricks, since after all, we didn't see this much of bricks. And I think that is exactly the Four point. minutes. Yes, Sorry. this is uh, exactly the point. We, uh, in the end, um, brick still is a finite material. Uh, so it has to be used with caution and a sense of economy. So it has only to be used for what it does best, which was in our feeling, cladding structure and providing the ensemble with urban presence. We have in more recent projects uh, done other things with bricks. Uh, since the increase in the size of the cavity wall, we have experimented with load bedding capacity surfacing brick. So in order to escape thermal bridges and definitely on our agenda would be to revive the lime based masonry uh, that would increase the, uh, the re uh, recycling capacities of bricks that uh, in, at this moment still suffers from fallacies in building norms, in, at least in our country. None of this was done in this early project, but the presence of brick on the site was of course the main uh, argument to also continue in brick. They are sustainable uh, and they are sustainable, sustainable because they are durable, they are lasting, they are produced nearby and they age well they weather well, if they are properly detailed at least, they can be repaired and you can uh, edit the demolition uh, at uh, great precision. So you can uh, decide very precisely what you would like to keep and what you have to remove or what you have to adapt with simply uh, adapting the masonry. Um, it is also durable in a cultural sense it provides uh, continuity for the urban scenery. It ties in with all the structures without denying, uh, on the other hand, its contemporaneity. It has an endless variety of hues, tones, ways of handling and uh, dealing with it. And as this uh, final image hopes to show, it uh, can very nicely blend in with nature. Thank you. This was my presentation. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Vermeulen, for your uh, interesting insights. Um, so yeah, uh, let's uh, continue right on um, and welcome our next speaker, Benjamin Ibora from uh, Barcelona. He is uh, one of the five founders and partners of uh, Misura Partners in Architecture, which operates uh, worldwide with two offices, one in Barcelona and one in Riyadh. Uh, on an interesting side note, I read on his LinkedIn page uh, that he also produces rights and plays in short movies and uh, theater plays. Um, today, however, I suspect he'll rather focus on his passion for architecture um, and show us his use case, the Keramic uh, Genius Loki from La Bisbal. Uh, thanks for being with us today. Um, the stage is yours, Mr. Ibora, if you would like to take over the screen sharing. Yes. Um, hello um, to everyone. Um, you see my, my screen? Yes. Okay. So first of all, I um, would like to, to thank you very much for your invitation the, to, to, to this uh, lectures. For us, it's always like a, a pleasure and an honor to, to explain our work. Um, and obviously, like um, when you ask us to, to talk about bricks, um, for us, is a, it was uh, quite interesting because um, we, we, we believe that bricks 
is a is a element it's a way of working that's been with us for a long time and uh, we believe that it's going to be with us for many many years and we really need to reinvent as we have been um, listening to to many um, lectures before thinking about how to do this in the future but um, just to give like another point of view we're going to explain uh, our view of, of how to construct construct with brick in a in a little house so we can see like uh, different um, ways of construction and in contrast to many things that we've been um, seen before so as you said thank you very much for the introduction uh, yeah in my um, um, extra hours which I, every time I, I find more difficult to find I do other stuff, I think that creativity or inspiration or however you want to call it um, comes from like um, searching in, uh, in different areas or in different experience in life, not only, but only, not only in only focusing in architecture. But in any way, I, I'm talking um, for Mesura. Um, we are a, a, a young, young team. Uh, we've been 15 years uh, as a studio. Um, we are a Barcelona-based studio, and this photo was a picture taken um, just before, well, during the, the, um, the construction of the house that I'm going to explain you. And uh, here, just for you to know that this is the team, I am explaining a project, but uh, we always like to thank you, the team that's been involved, and, and to mention them. Um, and in this picture, in these pictures, there's people from all around the world, which nowadays is more difficult with uh, the, the situation, but this is our our point of view is to be like a, 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 an international um, studio. No? Before explaining the project, I would like to explain a little bit who we are very briefly. Um, we, we defined uh, ourselves as uh, we designed for the unknown. We were born in, in, a, in a big, big recession, um, especially in Spain, where the, 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 the figure of the architect was totally in doubt and, and no longer um, anymore was no longer to any, anymore going to be the same so we had to reinvent ourselves and, um, and and we have done many things we are polyvalent studio and and we think that in nowadays we need uh, or we are, what we are finding is that uh, every year or every few years there's something going on in the world and uh, we need to be the people that needs to give answers to all these um, new questions and for that, the unknown. So we don't define ourselves as architects, we define ourselves as designers. And uh, we don't like to design uh, and explain ourselves for our product or our final images, but for uh, searching for new answers, for new questions. Um, we have also, for us, important our culture, our design principles that are more like the architecture um, uh, features, but also uh, we like to define ourselves as having human principles. We are a five partners team. Uh, we believe that nowadays working in team is a uh, is a uh, very important no and just very briefly in our value in our values we we like to to think that um, we are thriving community so we we want to give answers to what uh, the community um, really needs nowadays and of course um, we want to think in how is the contemporary way of living no in, in this many uh, things no, that, that this definition has and we also believe in the value of sense of place and I was remarking this point because in this project um, this matter of the sense of place is very strong I think that we live in a world that it's um, global it's international but uh, architects we need to um, go a little bit further in understanding um, and especially if we want to work in an international way to understand where we are doing our projects um, and what's, what's it all about over there, no? So this thing about the, the sense of this place. So our lecture today is called Genius Lucky Ceramic. It's, it's, I put it in Spain, in Spanish, just to make it a little bit more uh, interesting that I'm going to translate. Um, so what is Genius Lucky? Genius Lucky is a concept of the Romans that basically is, is talking about the protector spirit of the place. Uh, and in modern architecture, it's been, um, it's been reinterpreted by many others before us. And especially it's, it's basically is this idea of like understanding very well where are you going to construct and, and having um, an amount of respect of the place that you are working on. 
Um, this was the first concept of the definition of the, of the lecture, Genius Loki. The second one is the ceramic, Genius Loki ceramic. At the end, um, the ceramic uh, obviously is a very like uh, ambiguous um, definition, many, many, many applications, but basically it's, it's clay, it's clay, um, heated clay, uh, and, and the end is the same as, as the brick, but it's like going to the essence of, of, of how brick is done, no? So it's this concept of ceramic. And linking to our project and to this concept, basically we are working in an area where ceramic has been uh, a traditional um, economical motor of the local um, city that's near to the house, no? Um, and that's why our first decision when we were in this project is to work um, in a very like um, extended way with ceramic. So I'm marking in red the, the place where our project is. This is a, a, a little village next to La Bisbal. Um, and our project is really next to the village, but it's a little bit um, alone with a few neighbors. It's in a, obviously it's in an amazing, amazing uh, place. Um, this is very much a typical image um, of, a, of a village in, in, in the area, in, in Lampurda, in El Valle Empurda, where we have all these fields that during the year change a lot its colors. Here it's very green, but usually it's more brown. Um, and then we, we see these horizontal villages in the middle with these vertical points, which, uh, which uh, used to be like the, the churches. And this is the image of the house uh, pointing here. This is just to, to show you um, its, its surroundings. It's, um, it's in the middle of, of a very like um, uh, charismatic area in terms of nature. So um, in terms of not only this decision of understanding where we are working and how the historically its buildings have been done and for there the decision of working with ceramic, we also, want, we also like to listen and pay attention or, on the um, physical space that we are working. And here I like the four uh, principal um, main features that uh, at the end defined our, our project. Um, first would be um, the, the surroundings. We have two neighbors and we understand uh, the, the, the vegetation. It's um, the normal regulations were very strict with maintaining uh, the, um, the trees. And this was very good for us because it helped a lot in the in, in making decisions. But as you can see, the project is in this point here. This is the area where we could put the house. And in, in his back part of the house, it has like a, uh, like a lot of trees. Uh, and in front it's more like uh, open. And the second point is the, the landscape in terms of topography, uh, which we have like um, uh, this little hill that goes down and in the part where we can construct the house, we have like a more plain area, then we have a jump and we have another plain um, area here. And another feature that was very important are the views. It's a place that uh, when we went there the first time we saw like many, many, many different views and um, very different, no? Like just imagine uh, watching um, your own, like um, this place with the trees and then looking down and you have the fields. Then you look to the sun, you, you see a little village. And here, if you go up, you actually can see the sea. And this was important for the client, this matter of seeing the sea from an upper level. And obviously the, the, the sun and the climate in the, this is Mediterranean climate is like a um, heat, humid heat climate. And this is also important for us to, to take decisions, you know, to understand how this works and how the sun uh, can affect with the, with the house. So basically um, the, the decisions of the project was to do an L house, um, which divides like the public, more public space of the house with the more private, which would be like the rooms. Um, also, this idea of putting the house without touching a lot of landscape. So the L shape is also explaining this. We also create like a, a patio behind that it's enclosed by nature, not by not only by architecture, but by nature. And also this idea of like um, wanting to extend uh, the house through the landscape. In this case, with the swimming pool, uh, which is like also a very typical. Uh, element for this, um, for this area. No? And this idea in these first sketches of working 
with um, with walls, um, working with with the like a very local way of doing this um, what we call the Catalan bolt. So even if there's very like um, initial um, sketches and different for this the result, the intentions were pretty much the same from the beginning, no. And this would be like an axonometric of the of the final project where we see this. Um, here's the like the living area. Here's the dining area that that has this element that crosses all around the, the, the landscape, and then the rooms in this uh, in this park here. But anyway, I just wanted to go very quickly through this because uh, I think that it's nice to explain. Or today is going to be interesting to explain this house through the applications of the ceramic. Um, um, we have four main um, applications of the ceramic. The first one, as you see, uh, number one, is obviously these walls, um, which are brick walls, which is interesting to talk today. And in the second um, application, we, 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 we do with the ceramic the, the, the structure of the, of, the, of the roof, of the roof, sorry. A third application is this Catalan bolt that is this typical element from the area. And in the fourth um, um, application would be the pavement, which is also ceramic. Sorry. No. So the first um, application is what we called uh, in a classical way, uh, the brick. And here, well, what is this definition in Spanish of the brick? But obviously here's the explanation of how we apply the brick. Um, the, the house is made in a module in six by six so that uh, we don't have like a very big structure elements and we can do like a wall that doesn't have to, to, to support and a big amount of, of, of big structure issues, no? And at the end, we're doing what, what it would be like a typical local classical wall. It's like with two brick uh, walls, the interior one is the one that is the structure and the second one is, is the facade, which uh, in the middle we have um, the, the, the isolation well, uh, part, no? And um, what, is, uh, what was important also for us is to see that these two applications were, were differ different because the brick was different. And at the end, um, in the final image that we'll see, the house has um, a rendering that's made uh, from the local river called River Ter, and it's made with little stones from from River Ter uh, that's applied um, in, in this um, brick wall. Also, it's a project that uh, for us was interesting to um, not do big openings in all the in all the house, but to do um, openings that are like frames that are like um, in marking like a specific views at a specific highs uh, for the human um, scale or, or, or views. Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, it's not working, sorry. Sorry. So here you see that the, this um, Hero um, uh, brick wall that uh, we're talking about. This is what a photo of the construction. And this is the, the, this final uh, image of the rendering that I was telling you with these little stones of the river there that is also combinated with uh, ceramic pieces that at the end, what they're doing is in terms of co how to construct this rendering, it's giving this, uh, this, um, these uh, juntas, uh, these joints. And, and also um, the intention of these ceramic lines is to um, that the house has this like horizontal proportion, so it feels that it's more settled down in the landscape and it's not that aggressive. And also these lines uh, are lines that are changing a lot during the day because they give shade to the facade. And in terms of um, sustainability, um, this, this matter is important because at the end what we're doing is reducing the impact of the heat on this facade and then in summertime, um, even though here there's no like um, air conditioning, um, to make it work better, no, with with a natural ventilation, cross ventilation, to make this building work um, good in terms of climate, especially in summertime. 
In terms of the second application would be the, the, the roofs. And the roofs um, have, following the logic of the direction of the walls, have different directions, no? And, and they are, the, the ceramic piece is this Catalan industrialized um, um, bolt, which we see here that is changing um, with the directions of the, of the walls, no? And in this middle point, which is like a joint uh, of, the, of the building, uh, which is the, the dining area, the pieces are more horizontal, so we can give a different um, a feeling of the space. Uh, here we can see the combination of the, these different applications of the ceramic of the roof. Also, we see the application of the brick in the facade. This one is the structural one, and this one is the one of the facade. And here's the final- Four minutes, sorry. Four minutes, okay, sorry. I need to go faster then, sorry about this. The Catalan bolt uh, is this element here that um, was done uh, in a typical way with local um, constructors that have done this for many years. And this is the result. It's not exactly brick, but um, the, um, the construction of these walls was with brick, and then the vault is with, made with this, uh, with this ceramic. And then finally, uh, the pavement uh, that is done also with this um, ceramic piece, and it's only uh, located in this part here that is the one that makes these exterior parts to give the option to go to this part of the terrace or this one, depending on the climate conditions or the, 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 the time of the year and the time of the, of, the, of the day. And how this element is applied to this swimming pool uh, that is talking with the colors of its surroundings. And here's a, the other point of view that how these stairs are going up and entering the house uh, respecting the natural uh, jump that we, that we have. And, and finally, we wanted to end with this uh, Christian Norberg source uh, phrase, it's to dwell means to belong to a given place. And that's why for us it's important to understand that um, this house is a reinterpretation um, of the um, historical way of building in this area with local people, with the local knowledge, and, and for that working with a zero kilometer material and being this a very strong sustainable um, um, concept. And, and why? Because at the end, we believe that in, in some, even though it's reinterpreted to new ways of living, it is giving you in a way the sensation of belonging to that place, not to being something strange that is that it's there from zero, no? To be something that is a continuity of evolution but respecting the, the historical way of construction and local uh, culture and ways of living. And I just wanted to end uh, with um, some images, but especially with, uh, with a video that uh, can um, show the, the house. So thank you very much. This is everything from my part. And thank you everyone for listening to the explanation of Casa Ter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think this is making us all long for a vacation in Spain. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>
very um, welcome. You're very welcome. Yeah, it looks beautiful. Um, yeah, but for now, I think we're going to jump back to Austria for our last um, presentation today. Um, thank you, Mr. Ivora, for being so on point. Um, so last but not least, let's welcome Mario Kubista from Wienerberger AG. Uh, he's a civil engineer and has been working as a structural engineer and project manager in building construction and civil engineering since 1987. Uh, for the past 15 years, he's been the head of the wall and facade department at Wienerberger, as well as a member of the technical committee of the Austrian brick industry. Um, welcome, Mr. Kubista. Uh, you're sharing your screen already, so I think I don't need to say anything else, but handing over to you. You might still be muted. I'm not sure if you're talking to us already. But now you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thanks. And God. we can see your presentation too. So <laughs> okay. now it's perfect. Uh, uh, Mr. Ibora, it was a really nice project, and I would name it uh, Sound of Silence or something. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to tell you something about the building material awarded by Nature Plus. Uh, My name is Mario Kubista, you have heard, and uh, yes, uh, here is a view of a, of a southern periphery of Vienna, that's where I am right now, uh, it's the headquarter of the, the company I'm working for, and uh, I'm sitting here on the second floor, Uh, room number 2.17 for people who want to visit me. Uh, and with a view to the street that leads to the, to the south here. Uh, the green area with a, with a small lake uh, uh, is the area where the brick factories of Wienerberger were, lo were located until the 1970s. Uh, and since 1820, the clay was mined here and the bricks were fired with, uh, uh, and were fired, uh, with which the mo many, many buildings in, in Vienna were built. And now it is a, a, a area for a recreation for the people uh, who live nearby. Uh, here you can see a section through the Wienerberg. Uh, on, the, on the left, on the top, uh, is the headquarter of Wienerberger. And the dashed line was the old upper edge of the site in the, around, uh, in the, in the 19th century. And here you can see uh, the amount of clay that was extracted and fired into bricks. And uh, the site was uh, re-naturalized in the 19, 1980s. And now it's, uh, it's an area for recreation and to preserve biodiversity, like Mr. Gerhard Koch said before. Um, here, an, an overview over the uh, evolution of the brick. Um, here you can see, uh, we start with uh, a small format bricks here on the, on the left side. Uh, and uh, the background of the, of the further development was to reduce um, the working time. This was achieved by using larger formats reducing or replacing uh, the butt joint mortar and minimizing the mortar in the bed joint. And at last, uh, replacing the mortar with a PU form. And uh, the last uh, step in the evolution is the filling of a vertically perforated bricks with thermal insulation. Uh, 
Uh, here on this slide, you can see the development of the U value of masonry in Austria over the last uh, 100 years for a thickness, for a wall thickness of 50 centimeter unplastered. And uh, on the bottom, also the milestones, the, the red arrows on the, on the baseline uh, were uh, the uh, development of perforated bricks, large format bricks, uh, refinement of the hole pattern, and at last, the filling with mineral wool. And it is interesting to note that um, the development of a brick was based on the development in the car industry. Uh, in 1900, you see uh, on, on the right side, the first picture, uh, there was a, a simple robust brick and uh, a simple robust car was born from a well-known car brand. In 1979, this car brand launched a new class on the market and Wienerberger also named its new top product like this class. It's, it was it was the Poraderm uh, 38S. It was the S class in our in our brick family. And in the year 2013, uh, saw the birth of this brand's uh, hybrid car and Wienerberger uh, placed uh, a hybrid brick uh, on the market, the brick with the integrated thermal insulation. And uh, very important, in the year 2005, Nature Plus uh, stepped in, in our life. Uh, here I've, I've found uh, some old uh, product, da product data sheets to show you that uh, this was really the case and, and not a joke. Here you can see the Poroterm S, but also um, a middle step was a Poroterm 38SEL. Also this car brand has a SEL in his, in his family. And the last uh, uh, evolution in, in this class was around in the year 2000, the Poroterm 38S.I. Uh, let's come to Nature Plus. Here I show a geological map of Austria um, with all the plant locations that have passed a Nature Plus main test. Some of them have already been shut down. Uh, you can see the unfilled squares with the name La, Fürstenfeld and Apfelberg. But all others are still in operation today. And uh, you can also see here, why the plants are where they are. The raw material for brick production is located in this yellow, in this yellow colored zone. Uh, here an overview uh, about the, the, the plants uh, with the main and, and repeat testing. And you can see here that our first plant had its main uh, testing in 2006. And uh, this means that the preparations for this main testing started in 2005. And that Nature Plus came into my life in this year and also in the life of Wienerberger. And in total, uh, we have main audits, nine, nine main audits and 23 uh, repeat audits have been carried out um, so far. Here are a few impressions of a, of a Nature Plus test, which was carried out in Austria by the Institute for Building and Ecology. And uh, you see, there's a lot of data to be provided for each main and retest. And uh, the examiners are very precise and very strict and everything is questioned and every statement must be backed up with uh, verifiable data and all information is verified on, on site. We have also a sampling and uh, 
and, and testing of products on, on the site, uh, on, the, on the plant. And the products are taken for external laboratory testing directly from the production here after, after the kiln. Uh, two important test results for us are the measurement of radionuclides. We are sometimes uh, requests from customers for values of uh, radioactivity of bricks. Uh, that has always been a great help for us to have uh, results. And also the heavy metal analysis. This data helped us a lot when when new building materials uh, recycling regulation was introduced in Austria. The issue here was the setting of and compliance with limit uh, values. And we get also a factory specific life cycle assessment calculation uh, from uh, with CIMA Pro and with data from, from ECHO Invent. Yes, and the highlight of the visit of the building trade fair in Munich was always the presentation of the current new Nature Plus certificate by Mr. Schmitz. You can see here Mr. Schmitz and me in both pictures, uh, like uh, best friends over the years. Know something about our most modern bricks, uh, bricks with vertically perforated uh, hollows um, with integrated thermal insulation made of mineral wool. And until now, the Nature Plus label was only available for the brick without filling. But I have heard that Nature Plus is currently working on a award guideline so the working group uh, in the Criteria Commission, uh, in which the brick with a mineral wool filling can also be uh, certified. The mineral fibers stand vertically in the chambers of a brick, and brick by brick in the masonry are not exposed to any, to any load. It's a pure, a pure mineral solution, and there's no gluing, it's important for the preparation uh, later. And um, this product is very important for us because we have a product with technical values that makes multi-story monolithic construction with brick possible again. Uh, just like in, in early years uh, or in early days of the of the Gründerzeit around, uh, around 19, 1900. I show you now a few built examples on the following slides. Here you can see a, a residential complex with four stories in uh, Klagenfurt. And here uh, a, a five-story building uh, is also possible, an office building in Innsbruck. And uh, here, six stories in an office building in, in Rötis in Vorarlberg. Uh, it's like a Bauhaus style building. And uh, uh, it's, it's nice to, to know that the, the, the most residential and office buildings uh, from the Gründerzeit uh, have also five to six stories. And it seems to be the limit of brick construction, but with our new brick type, we can also build uh, seven floors. Uh, here is a very new building in, in Vienna, in, in the Son a loft living project in the, in the Sonnenwendviertel. And, uh, and, uh, but now we have a project uh, uh, in, the, in the 12th district of Vienna. It's called Wildgarten, Wohnen am Rosenhügel. Um, there are two residential buildings with eight stories and uh, will build uh, in uh, the end of 2020, uh, 2021 to 2022. And uh, 
these eight uh, stories are possible because we we launched uh, or the, we will launch in the summer a new static software. Uh, and with this software, it will be possible to to make a finite element analysis of a 3D building in masonry construction. So here, a picture of our, of our anti, entire product family for multi-story construction with monolithic block, uh, monolithic brick exterior walls. Uh, in the following slides, I will tell you something about the recycling concept for this brick. Uh, the mineral offcuts in the production plant. Uh, they will be collected in a container. And uh, the container, if the container is full, the, the, uh, we bring it back to the manufacturer of the mineral wool. And uh, he gives the uh, he give a product spec in the mineral wool uh, production. We have also uh, cut-offs in the production of uh, prefabs. Uh, and here we also sample uh, the, the mineral wool pads and uh, they also goes back to the manufacturer. And uh, also on the side, uh, here, Wienerberger offers a free collection service in Austria for mineral wool that uh, accumulates at, on construction sites when uh, bricks are, are cut. These offcuts also go into the container in the, in the uh, brick plant and goes back to the manufacturer. Uh, we have a decision. Four minutes. Okay, thank you. We have a decision from the district authority for this uh, measure and uh, information sheets for our customers. You can see here. Uh, here again, the decision uh, from the district administration in, in uh, Upper Austria. And here you can see the collection container in, in hiding plant is rented from the Energie AG Linz. And uh, it's a press container for two uh, to three uh, tons or 20 cubic meter uh, mineral wool. Uh, transport is with uh, a trailer and uh, the container will uh, bring back the mineral wool to the production plant in Germany. Um, and what happens once a building with bricks filled with mineral wool is demolished? Here we have we tested a solution uh, to, to separate the bricks from the, from the mineral wool. The bricks are broken and the two mineral fractions are separated with an air classifier and due the large difference in, uh, in raw density, uh, uh, this works very, really very excellently. And the mineral wool goes back to the, manuf to the manufacturer and there are various applications for the brick chippings, like for as, as fill material or aggregate for concrete and so on and so on. Uh, on my last slide, I show you we tried also, we tested also various other insulation materials for filling bricks, uh, mostly biogenic fillers, uh, but biogenic fillers have shown major problems with moisture. Uh, the, dura the durability was really a problem for this kind of fillers. And uh, it was, the problems are it, it mold and it rots and uh, also problems in case of fire. You can see here, it, it was a test with wood fiber, hemp fiber, uh, hull grain, straw, coconut fiber, and also sheep's wool. But the best solution we saw was the filling with uh, mineralic uh, uh, materials. So 
uh, oh, if this is the last slide, excuse me. Uh, a little look in the future. Uh, we are in the process of creating BIM objects for brick walls. And uh, the Nature Plus data will also be included here to provide planners with, uh, with access to it and any time. And we combine our data and we have really a lot of data uh, with data from other companies, uh, from the mortar and insulation industry. And with a BIM tech tool, components can be made available for the 3D software programs commonly used on the market, like Revit, Archicad, or Alplan. So thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for your presentation. Um, all right, so um, there are a few questions uh, in the chat that we all noted down and we still have, um, yeah, some time to, to do the Q&A now. So um, for everyone planning their lunch already, we will finish at one uh, o'clock the latest. Um, but yeah, depending on how, how many questions uh, there are still coming up um, beyond the chat, and how long the answers will take, but um, it's going to take no longer than uh, 1 a.m. Uh, Mr. Kubista, please uh, stop sharing your screen uh, so mm -hmm. we can just see um, the video, the, the people. Um, and to all presenters, uh, speakers, it would be great if you could switch on your video again, or also um, the participants who would like to show themselves just so we have a few faces here and a personal touch. A um, few words about this discussion now. Um, so um, participants, uh, feel free to raise your hand if you would like to, um, to ask a question now spontaneously. Um, but if you do, um, please address the speaker you would like to know something from and then to all people involved, uh, participants and speakers alike, keep it short and to the point because the more we do that, the more questions we can get through. Um, Paul van Möhlen unfortunately had to leave us um, already due to other commitments. So if you have any particular questions to him, uh, feel free to um, write them into the chat and we will be happy to pass them on to him. Already, all right. So um, let's start maybe because uh, the first uh, presentation of Gerhard Koch raised a few questions. And I think uh, Mr. Koch, you already have a good overview of, of what people wanted to know from you from um, yeah, some questions about um, recycling, how to close the loop within um, circular economy with clay bricks, which were questions from Andrea Heil as well as um, the replacement of fossil energy um, in production. Um, and then we had a question from Dr. Horst Lunza about um, what happens with the insulation inside, um, since bricks are said to be lasting very long, but what about the insulation? And also what about CSP for energy building bricks? And Judith Ottig wanted to know if you also produce mud bricks. So yeah, shoot. Okay, <laughs> and I let tried. me know if you need any reminders of these questions. Okay, um, I try to be to be brief. Um, I think um, I'm very grateful for the question about the time plan of our roadmap um, because that's a very uh, valid question, and I'm pleased to to explain a little bit. I mean. Um, when I said that um, we intend to fully decarbonize our production process, um, I was referring to the uh, EU Green Deal, which sets the ultimate goal that Europe becomes um, carbon neutral by 2050. And that's what uh, our intention is as well. I understand that the CO2 budget of Germany will be uh, over uh, by the year 2028, but please understand that um, the process of decarbonizing our industry cannot be done overnight. Alone Wienerberger has 130 production plants in Europe. And at the moment, we are in the pilot phase. We are trying out our technological ideas. 
And um, when that works, when we can prove that it is possible to have a brick plant that is at uh, net zero carbon, then we can start rolling that out. Having said that, it will not be one single solution. It will be a bunch of different technological solutions. Um, biogas or biomass is an option. For example, a big uh, French clay block manufacturer, they have decided to mainly go for uh, biomass as a fuel. Others will um, use uh, syngas or biogas, green gas uh, for production. Um, there's the possibility, which I already mentioned, to electrify our kilns. That is maybe at the relatively short um, uh, notice the easiest uh, solution to electrify our kilns. Of course, it depends on the availability of sufficient amount of green electricity, um, which will be a big so um, societal uh, challenge in the future to provide enough green electricity for all these industrial processes. Um, so it's a bunch of a, a package of, of different solutions and we are trying them out. We will have first results within, I would say the next five years. So the first uh, carbon neutral brick plants will be existing within the next five years. But to say it very clearly, of course it will not be possible to decarbonize the whole brick industry in Europe in the next five years. That will take a lot longer and that will also need some preconditions to be fulfilled. Number one, it will cost an enormous amount of money. And to be very honest, our industry will not alone be able to finance that from our profits. So we will need public subsidies. There is a lot of money available on the EU level. Um, we have already asked for uh, fundings from the EU programs, be it either uh, the ETS related um, uh, innovation fund where we have already forwarded a big project or be it other sources. But we will need such fundings to be able to finance this technological transition. Second, we need a stable legal framework. And to be very honest, the uh, current pricing of CO2 works against us because if we have to buy more and more um, expensive uh, certificates until we have managed the transition, then we have less money to invest in our plants. So um, what we ask for is a stable legal framework at stable cost, not steeply increasing cost every year. If you look at the CO2 price, it's, it's amazing how it goes up, yeah? but that means we have less money to invest in our technological transition. So to sum up, yes, we can, yes, we will, but it will, it will need time and more than five years. Sorry to say that in, in five years, we will have first plants, but the whole industry that will take longer. Second, we will need financial support from the EU and we will need a stable legal framework. So I hope that um, summarizes this topic of how will things evolve in the, in the near future about recycling? Um, yes, you are right. Somebody in the chat said um, uh, most of the um, material coming from deconstruction or from demolition sites goes to landfill. That was true in the past, but it is uh, changing currently. There are many possibilities what to do with this recycling material. Not all of them are currently economically reasonable. I agree with that. It's an economic problem, but it is possible. Also closed loop recycling, which was also mentioned, is possible. Not by 100%, of course, yeah, but we can add clay recycling material into our uh, raw material mix in our production by up to 10, 15% without compromising the technical quality of our product. So also closed loop is possible. And we are currently working on new ideas how to make use of this recycling material to upgrade it from product value, to make it economically more feasible to do this recycling and specifically recycling of the filled blocks, which are filled with um, mineral wool 
or by the way, in, in southern Germany, there is another option. Uh, the infill is made of perlite, uh, volcanic, uh, very lightweight material. Both is 100% mineral. Um, the recycling is easy. Mario Kubista showed it. There was a big research project carried out in Weimar, which demonstrated how that can work. But please uh, forgive us, we do not have practical experience yet because these products are on the market since let's say 10, 15 years. Those buildings, thank God, are not yet demolished. So they will still uh, stand there for quite much longer, but technically it is proven that there's no problem to separate the infill insulation from uh, the ceramic shell of the blocks. And um, I wanted also to say somebody uh, questioned how uh, can recycling of clinker bricks, which are used here for the facade of the Wienerberger headquarters in Vienna can be done. In fact, that is already current practice. It has become a business to collect such facing bricks or clinker bricks uh, from demolition sites to clean them and to resell them. And sometimes for a much higher price than the freshly produced uh, bricks. I give you an example from Denmark. Denmark is a country which is very advanced when it comes to um, recycling in the construction materials industry. There is a company which has uh, specialized on that, Gamle Murstein. They sell these old bricks and they, are, uh, they have a 100% re recycling quota uh, nowadays in, in Denmark already. There was a question about the uh, durability of the infill, of the thermal insulation infill. Um, well, it is 100% mineralic, therefore, I believe, I mean, again, those products are in use since 10, 15 years, so we do not really have the long time experience, but I believe, and tests being carried out uh, confirm that, that this mineralic infill will stand as long as the block as such. So there will be no degradation. And that's also the reason why the organic infill materials are not really um, an, an alternative. It would be nice from the ecological viewpoint, no doubt, but the long-term perspective is a bit problematic. Yeah, I think we will talk about insulation uh, a bit more because there were a few questions to Mr. Kubista about that. Mm -hmm. Would you sum it up, Mr. Koch, so we can give the other speakers an opportunity to answer some questions as well? Of course, yeah. I, I mean, from, from my perspective, I, th I have covered the points, the most important points I have noted down. There's just one last point I would like to mention. Um, there was a lot of discussion in the chat um, about recycling, circular economy, um, using old buildings as a source, etc. I just want to say one of the biggest advantages of ceramic products, of bricks, roof tiles, is their longevity. I have shown in my presentation how old buildings still stand there and do work still. And I think this longevity of our product, this is the best prevention uh, against um, not uh, closing loops, not recycling, yeah? because if the building is still in use, you do not need to uh, build a new one. So this longevity, I think, is one of the biggest advantages of, of our ceramic materials. All right. So for me, that's it. Thank you. Perfect. Um, I think Judith Ottich wanted to know about the mud bricks. Maybe you can answer her in the chat. I suppose this might be able. you might be able to write that down the answer um, if you also produce mud, mud bricks. Um, all right, Tillman, uh, come to my aid. Do you have a good uh, overview of other questions from the chat? Do we have anything for Mr. Ibora maybe? Um, yes, like there were two more uh, technical questions about the characteristica of, um, yeah, of bricks. And so, yeah, I think, um, uh, Mr. Ibora would be a good person to address them. So uh, one was uh, regarding the acoustics 
of um, Briggs. Uh, the question came from Andrea Heil, building division of Munich City. Um, and she wrote, we have a big problem with the acoustic. If we want to use monolithic clay blocks for exterior walls in public buildings, the planners say um, that the noise can easily go from one room to another. Since you're um, yeah, working a lot with um, well, ceramics and bricks, maybe you can um, uh, say a little bit about that and maybe the other um, other speakers also would like to add something. And um, the second question, if I may, uh, was about um, should the insulation be outside normally so the condensation of water is not in the bricks? So the bricks should uh, have an construction with an outside and an inside wall. This question came from uh, Dr. Horst Lunzer, Energy and Umwelt. Um, so one question about the acoustics and the other about the insulation characteristics of bricks. You're still muted. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, there Sorry. you go. There we are. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of acoustics, um, I believe that especially in, in, in Casa Ter, for example, like um, in the facade, we, there's not that much um, uh, issue in terms of um, we have this double facade, no double brick, um, so there's like a very good in, um, acoustic isolation from the outside, and um, through the rooms, um, yeah, I think that there's the, an issue over there with with brick, but I think that um, it can easily be solved with the with the type of bricks that you have. There, are, there are bricks that are made for 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 being especially with um, uh, to be have a lot of isolation uh, properties acoustic but um, obviously this is very an, an in-house is very personal issue and also depends in the um, in the economy resources that um, the client has no and and for there you can give like a, a, an options because i believe that one good thing about the brick is the amount of options that uh, that you have in terms of technical aspects no uh, and in Casa Ter, this was not a big issue. The, the client also, is, um, he likes a lot um, a noisy life or, or to <laughs> that there's no, no filter and, and there's no private, um, privacy. And this is very Mediterranean in a way. Um, uh, there's no, this, this uh, thing about privacy in terms of visually and acoustically is not as strong as uh, in other cultures. So um, in these terms, it's not that much a problem, but obviously in other kinds of projects, uh, we do have um, these kind of problems with, obviously when you work with um, systems like Pladur, there have like systems that are obviously like uh, do that. But in terms of, of, of bricks, it, I think it's a term of, the, the, um, um, do you have many options no, to, to isolate? Like one would be to use a, a, a brick that is thicker and has uh, like um, like has uh, like um, air uh, like holes, no? So it creates this isolation. The other way is to do two walls and put like a iso acoustic isolation in the middle. So I, I believe that there's many options to to solve this. It's a matter of knowing what's your budget and what's your expectations and what is the dimensions that you can use, no? Um, in terms of um, the second questions. Um, what is important in our climate, especially, is like um, for humidity, is ventilation. Um, all these walls need to have little ventilation. So at some point, air uh, crosses, and when you have some ventilation crossing inside the facade, uh, you don't have this con uh, condensation. So uh, ventilation would be the answer in terms of technical answer to 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 fight against this condensation issue. So. Um, although um, we have in the middle this um, um, thermical uh, lana de roca, I don't know what's the name, we also put some holes at some strategic points so that space in the middle uh, has some uh, natural ventilation. Okay, thank you. I think insulation is a matter of interest here um, anyway, so maybe um, let's move on to Mr. Kubista um, mm -hmm. in the chat. There were a few suggestions about materials to be used for insulation and maybe you could um, 
yeah, uh, say something about that. So I'll just read to you. Um, so have you, uh, Fred Vanderberg wanted to know, have you also done tests with bio-based materials as insulating a filling like wood fibers, cellulose or hemp? Uh, Sissy Fersbig um, suggested mycelium insulation. Um, another one was, um, have you any experience with popcorn insulation? And Andrea Heil also asked about seagrass insulation. So there's lots of ideas. Um, <laughs> what's your your experience here? <laughs> yes, um, uh, as, as Gerhard Koch said, uh, brick is a very durable building material. And uh, it is said to be uh, the most forgiving building material. Uh, think, for example, uh, of the effects of moisture. It's, for brick, moisture is no problem. And so the filling, all filling materials must have the same durability. It's, it's, it's a must, it's a must. And uh, uh, I showed you, we have tested uh, wood fiber uh, and uh, wood fiber has really a problem, a problem with moisture. It was, it was not, not okay for us. We tested also the mycelium insulation. It was very interested. Uh, but for us, a great problem, uh, it was the regulation or, or, or to stop the growth of a mycelium. We, it's, it was a problem for us. We, we, we have not got a grip on the growth of a mycelium. Uh, seagrass, uh, we tested not. Uh, I think it, it is the same like elephant grass. I don't know. Uh, seagrass and elephant grass, we uh, didn't test it. Uh, also not popcorn. <laughs> but, uh, but another good solution uh, are expanded, expanded perlite. It's also a proven uh, fill material. Uh, we test, but we tested also cellulose. Yes, we tested, but also cellulose had a, has a problem with moisture. But you see, we, we try all products uh, who could be fine to fill our brick, but, uh, uh, but not all materials are really uh, functional. All right, um, Mr. Koch, would you like to add something brief? Uh, you're muted, sorry. <laughs> you should unmute yourself first. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I would like to briefly come back to the uh, acoustic insulation topic. Um, the question from Andrea Heil. Uh, I think it's important to say that these filled blocks where there is a mineral infill they have a very robust ceramic structure. So they have thicker uh, shells and webs than those clay blocks, which have no integrated insulation. And therefore, um, with this thicker, more uh, robust structure, they also provide a better acoustic performance. So maybe um, you could try out such um, blocks with um, mineral wool or expanded perlite infill. They are available on the market in, in Bavaria from uh, our colleagues from the company Schlagmann. And they have an excellent acoustic performance as well. So the problem um, you mentioned in your chat um, contribution that you have difficulties with the sound insulation between dwellings um, can easily be solved if you use these more robust filled clay blocks. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can say example for, for what Mr. Koch said. Uh, for example, brief, yes, because we, I would like to hand over to Doris Wirt before okay, we run just, out of Just one, one short sentence. <laughs> for example, our, our mineral wool filled brick in the thickness of 50 centimeter, uh, I showed you in the, in the U value uh, curve, uh, has an U value of 0 0.13 without plaster, uh, has a 
for the sound insulation, uh, RV value of uh, 50 and more, 50 and more decibel. And the, for the static, the FK value is nearly uh, to five Newton per square millimeter. And these three values are the base to build uh, uh, multi-story buildings without problems with the static, the sound insulation and the heat in insulation. Okay. Mrs. Beard, um, would you like to add anything to insulation? Otherwise, I have uh, two more questions to you. Um, but there was one insulation question also directed at you, um, which is also like the, yeah, should the insulation be outside normally so the condensation of water is not in the brick? I think Mr. Ibora has answered this, but if you'd like to add anything, um, please do. But there is, no, you're fine, good. Um, so let's, um, Move on, Fred Vanderberg wanted to know, um, uh, maybe I missed it, but how are the bricks connected? Are they easy to separate, like in the ancient Middle Age buildings? Uh, well, I was talking about clinker, not about uh, normal bricks. Uh, so the clinker, they are uh, based on a panel and they are put on the facade as, a, as an extra shield um, with, uh, an inter uh, um, an interspace of four centimeters where uh, air can ventilate through. Uh, so, um, and this is also why uh, there were a few words about uh, reuse or recycling of the clinker with a big question mark and so on in the chat. And I think uh, if we are talking about um, isolation and facade solutions, I think that the clinker will have a great future because it will last for 100 years and more on the facade. Therefore, also the isolation of the mineral, uh, of the rock wall uh, behind it, um, uh, it is really well protected and it will also last for 100 years and more. Uh, so these types of facades, they, they really, um, you know, they protect, uh, they, they age noble, they look nice. And plus after 100 and 150 years, uh, you can dismantle these clinker and you can reuse them, not recycle, not pulverize them or do, do anything to them, but take them as the clinker as they are and uh, reuse them on another facade. And I think uh, following the discussion, it's really, really important that we switch uh, to uh, brownfield development or reuse of old buildings, making them new, rehabilitate old buildings, making them modern, making them... Um, uh, more sustainable than they are uh, due to uh, just taking the structure and do nice things to them so that they can nicely serve us further on. And I think this is the main development that uh, we will have in the construction business and real estate business in the future. Uh, never built on Greenfield. And there was also a question concerning um, certification. Does it make any sense uh, to certify buildings uh, if, they, uh, if the certification does not follow the 1.5 uh, degrees criteria and aims? Um, uh, I think um, when you do a certification according to DGNB, uh, you can be sure that, and, and you have a result of platinum, uh, like it is the case with the brick, uh, the home building of Wienerberger. Um, then you can be sure that you have followed the principles of the taxonomy, um, uh, the EU taxonomy. And in this case, we are 100% compatible with the EU taxonomy rules. Um, and the building is top. It is simply a very, very sustainable building, even though some of the part of it, um, how to say, uh, some parts of it, like the, the concrete steel structure, of course, it's not something that we want for all the buildings uh, in the future. But um, on the other hand, uh, this is compensated by so many uh, perfect and nice uh, qualities of the building and its design, and especially also the materials apart from the concrete steel, um, so that we end up with DGMB platinum, we end up with a complete uh, 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 with a complete, uh, how do you say, uh, a correlation to the EU taxonomy rules, um, and we, uh, and this is what what the future will, you know, 
this is what, what how the future has to be uh, with buildings. We will always need high buildings uh, for office use, and we will sometimes still tear down old buildings like the Coca-Cola production facilities and then put their new buildings like the brick. Um, on the other hand, yes, if there are structures which, which can be reused, then we should reuse them. And uh, it's our, our task to, to make this difference in the future and decide correctly, make positive and good decisions. All right. Yeah. Thank you. I think these were excellent closing words, uh, except if there's, I think there's no more questions from the chat um, and no raised hands or a Tillman, correct me if I skipped anything, but to my knowledge. No, I think you're right. Like the chat is really interesting to read there. So um, <laughs> yeah, they're do invited that. To, to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I saw no further question now. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you everyone to all um, speakers and participants for being so active in the chat, for discussing also kind of controversially, uh, which I think is always valuable in a web seminar like this. Um, and yeah, it's very nice to see how engaged everyone is with this topic. So thank you for this. Um, so we are almost at the end and it's almost lunchtime, um, but now we have one more question to you. Um, I think I announced it in the beginning and Tillman will show the poll. Take your time. It's okay. We're hungry, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, so now moment of truth. Um, did the web seminar change your perspective on bricks in any way? So. Um, is it absolutely? I see more potential in BRICS as a sustainable resource now than before. Is it my opinion stayed the same or is it, well, actually my opinion of BRICS as a sustainable building material has been lowered? Uh, how do I take part in this? What do I have to do? I think because you're a co-host, you can. Ah, okay. Yeah, because <laughs> I can't either. <laughs> But yeah, yeah. If, if anyone would to add anything to this question, um, the chat is still open. So um, Mrs. Wirtz, feel free to, then it's not anonymous though. <laughs> the poll is anonymous. Okay. All right. No, there are still a few people selecting their answers. Just one more second. I think it's done. Tilman, show us the results. And it's uh, very nice and mixed, um, mixed crowd here, but the majority says um, the opinion stayed the same. 28%, uh, um, almost a third, um, see more potential now. And 16% say uh, my opinion has been lowered. So uh, mixed, mixed effects on, on the audience, but it's nice to see that um, there's always also some positive um, development. All right. So yeah, with this, we're coming to the end of, of this week's uh, web seminar. I'm just going to present my screen for one more minute or two more minutes so Tillman can say a few um, closing words, um, sorry. There we go. And from my side already, um, again, thank you very much for being so active and interactive. It was a very fun session for me to host. And I'm looking forward to meeting you again in one of the upcoming sessions. And now with this, I say goodbye and please, Tillman, <laughs> finish it up. Yes, just some uh, wrapping word, um, final words, maybe. Um... Yeah, first of all, I really have to say thank you to the to the speakers and to this very fruitful uh, discussion we had in the chat. So we saw really fantastic um, building examples all over Europe, also inspiring for working spaces or for making next location close to Barcelona, when I understood it correctly. Also, um, we had a very interesting assessment about the transition of the um, brick production and also helpful insights into the technical and also sustainable uh, characteristics of um, bricks and ceramic. Um, 
we also saw a lot of passion for this building material by our brick manufacturers. And I also want to thank uh, to the audience for the critical question and also widening, widening the picture. Yeah, um, again, thanks for the discussion. And uh, maybe next slide, please. I really, ah, yeah. Um, okay, I said um, here again, thanks to our sponsors. I really have to um, say it again. It's um, they're really helping us to um, host such events, um, especially League Nutrient and Wienerberger. Thank you for that. Um, if you want to find more about them uh, and also contact info, please go on our um, sponsors forum. There you find uh, contact info and there you can um, can go for further discussion if you like. And yes, talking about discussion, there will be uh, more uh, web seminars in our series. Um, we talked a lot in, like in the chat, um, bio-based materials were quite a topic and also recycling, urban mining. And as you can see here, we will address these topics. So um, if you haven't done it yet, register. And I really looking forward to see many of you again in the next um, web seminars. And now, yeah, it's one o'clock and I would say, let's make a early weekend and yeah, really have a good time this week. And, and if you have any further question, feel free to contact us um, afterwards. So um, Kati, you already had your last words. We will, um, we won't close the um, the presentation immediately. So if you want to go into once again into the chat, uh, make some notes or also to take some links, um, you have the time for that. Five more minutes, and yeah, nice weekend to everyone.